So again, thank you for uh, coming back after the break. We appreciate your presence. A couple of things, uh, you know, related to the presentation, going back to uh, where we were at um, in our brief presentation about the Kane County Fiber. One of the things that I, I forgot to mention and want to be sure that uh, people have information about, which is how to communicate or get connected with some of the folks that are, are up here on this panel and also um, some of the folks in the industry. We, we put together a, a website for information and contact information about our partners and resellers and some of the maps and some of the slides that you saw. Those are going to be available uh, on their website. It's fiber.countyofcane.org. There's some information out at the uh, uh, tables outside as well if you're interested in contacting us. A lot of what we're trying to do is, is just be that person to connect people to the right resources. So um, we look forward to hearing from you. We're also going to be looking at uh, establishing some more regional type of workshop efforts where we can come out and talk with some of the communities or some of the, the people that are interested. So with that, um, we're going to be doing a, a little bit of a panel discussion, a little bit of a give and take uh, with some of the experts that are in this industry in Kane County. So I'm really happy to uh, introduce our panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves uh, as each of them represent a little bit different area of business, a little bit different area of expertise. And we'll start on this end closest to me with Troy Mertz. So I'll let uh, Troy, you can start and we'll pass. Pass my phone. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Troy Mertz, and I have the uh, pleasure of being a developer in Kane County and in Gilberts, in, uh, Gilberts, which is in Kane County, and in Algonquin, which is in Kane County. And in my project in Gilberts, uh, we've been working on fiber to the home technology uh, to serve the community. And uh, so I am now uh, uh, the uh, founder of FOSIVA, an internet uh, service provider here in Kane County. The fastest growing internet service provider in Kane County. We started with one customer in January uh, of this year and we now have five. So we've grown 500% uh, from, that, from that time. So, uh, Good morning, my name is Matt Parks. I'm the Senior Director of Network and Infrastructure Services at NIU. In addition to my oversight of NIU's campus enterprise network telephony and server infrastructure, I also lead NIU's Broadband Development Consulting Group, which is a group of uh, consulting professionals that works with a lot of public sector entities in Kane County around Northern Illinois uh, to expand the reach of technology with their operation. In addition, I'm the executive director of iFiber, an Illinois nonprofit organization that owns and operates an 800 mile fiber optic network, gigabit network, you gotta remember the gigabit, right? Yeah. Uh, network uh, throughout the nine counties of Northwest Illinois. Uh, we have three main services that we provide with that network. First and foremost, it's gigabit, lit, and dark fiber service to hundreds of community anchor institutions in that region. Those anchors are made up of schools, libraries, municipalities, police and fire, 911, and healthcare. We also offer dark fiber throughout the entire region as well for the telco and commercial markets. And lastly, uh, we offer a, a new, as of 2016, commercial lit service to the private sector market that we leverage through our third party agreements with providers that connect into iFiber. It's good to be here, thank you. My name is John Duggan. I'm the Vice President of Sales with Bike Grid Data Centers. Uh, we're a data center company with a location here in Aurora serving this market, but we have locations spread across the United States. Uh, we are heavily focused in the basic co-location all the way up through managed services and cloud services for the most overused word right here. So we are the cloud for those of you in Aurora. Um, pleasure to be here. Personal comment for me here at the Q Center. Uh, I had my very first ever job interview right out of school here against my best friend. We are the tops in our classes. He got the job, I didn't. And I'm back here talking to you nice people today. <laughs> so, um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about us afterwards, we have a booth outside. Keith is out there helping man the booth so we can talk a little bit more about our services. Our heaviest focus in the market, though, clearly is our compliance and our resiliency. So anybody here who's focused in the healthcare space, bio, pharmaceutical, banking, financial, we have all the necessary accreditations in our data centers to support you from a process, procedure, and a security perspective. And for those of you that would even know what ENAC is, if you're in the biopharmaceutical space, we're the only nationally accredited ENAC certified uh, data center organization. So please come talk to us if you'd like to. Thanks for having me. 
morning. My name is Dave Cushing, and I'm with Sinesis. And first, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the, the invitation this morning. Um, Sinesis owns and operates fiber networks across the country. We've been in business for over 15 years, and a lot of what we do is connect customers these days to centers like the one that John uh, and his company run. Um, we are wholly owned by Crown Castle International, which is, I think, going to be interesting in this discussion because what Crown does is build wireless infrastructure. And why is that important for fiber? More and more, uh, in addition to the 40,000 cell towers that Crown owns across the country, the wireless companies are infilling their coverage areas because of all the devices that we all carry all the time that we always want on. And so they bought us because of our fiber footprint. Together now, we own 16,000 route miles across uh, the United States, mostly in major markets, mostly metro fiber networks, very dense. And uh, my job really is to work with uh, organizations, governments, uh, and end users uh, to connect them to that fiber for the benefits of private bandwidth um, delivery. So thank you very much. <coughs> Um, looks like it's still good morning. Um, I'm Mark McCoy. I'm with Onlight Aurora. Uh, Onlight Aurora is an internet service provider. Started uh, based on the 62-mile 62 fi fiber network that the city of Aurora uh, put in the ground about eight years ago under the leadership of uh, Tom Weisner and his chief technology officer, uh, Ted Beck. Um, what we offer is services um, everywhere from Metro Ethernet services, dark fiber, lit wave services, uh, internet services from 50 meg, um, uh, and possibly up to 100 gig. Uh, right now we're serving one uh, up to 10 gig. Um, we also have some of our customers connected via wireless. We've been going for about four years now and uh, have connected three of our school districts, three of our parochial schools, the Illinois Math and Science Academy, Britta's back over here, um, the Wabonsi Community College, the Aurora Public Library, so when we get those types of collaboration going between the schools, that was one of our goals, but we also have the Rush Copley Hospital, other the financial institutions, and we also have five or 144 strands into the bike grid facility, into the CME Cyrus One facility, and we're in talks right now to offer lit wave services between those two facilities and the um, new continuum facility up in uh, West Chicago. And of recent, we've formed some additional partnerships with Kane County where we're working with them to provide services to one of our customers who's located a new facility in Aurora with a, a second facility in Batavia, and then offering Kane County services to get into the bike grid facility uh, locally in our area. So welcome and uh, glad to be here. And Mike Burke again, <clears throat> be glad to answer any questions on my presentation. One apology, I, f I f didn't say anything about the Gen X generation. Um, in my mind, th <laughs> they're just waiting for us baby boomers to, to move out of the way. So, But I would be glad to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. The uh, first question that I had uh, prepared was based on what services uh, or benefits do you see coming from the Kane County fiber optic network? So specific to the Kane County network, how do you use that network or how, how would you see uh, a customer potentially using that? And I'm gonna direct that question uh, to Troy Mertz to start our uh, conversation. Thank you. Uh, my company, Fosiva, has recently become a customer of Kane County um, through the network that we've built. And uh, to not get too technical, uh, as a real estate developer, to give you a little bit of a uh, background to the story of the Conservancy development, it's a, a 995 home subdivision in Gilberts, Illinois. And um, I, I came to Kane County Board um, a, a probably about a year and a half ago or so, maybe two years ago, with the problem that we were trying to uh, turn the lights back on on a, on a subdivision that only had two model homes but was planned for a 1,000 homes. And it had gone into disrepair, had sat there for seven or eight years or so, um, had a lot of um, uh, burdens on the property, and we were able to work with uh, the Village of Gilberts and with the Kane County government and the uh, Kane County Board uh, to turn the lights back on in there. And so we, we began uh, uh, developing the project and getting the homes uh, ready for construction. And it was an absolutely, I'm, I'm very proud, very excited in it, uh, of, of what the project is and what I hope it can become. Uh, but my one uh, concern 
and you guys that are here, there's a lot of um, municipal uh, people here, so you hear, uh, as a developer, you hear, my concern is, um, so one of my concerns as a developer was that the village of Gilberts did not have uh, good internet access, and so um, I would like to acknowledge, first and foremost, uh, Bill Beeth here, uh, who is from the village of Gilberts, and he's an economic uh, development uh, coordinator for the village of Gilberts, and he spent a lot of time and has a, a great resume here in Kane County. I know there's a lot of people who are familiar with Bill and, and his work, uh, but but uh, I, I didn't really understand why there were so, so many satellite dishes in, in Gilberts. You'd, you'd drive by, you'd see three satellite dishes on a home, and... Uh, or you know, uh, or, you know, uh, some homes would have uh, more than 50% of the homes had those satellite dishes on on the side of the home, and I actually live in Algonquin in Kane County, and I have Comcast, but I I have Directv because I, I I don't like either one of them, but that's my own personal opinion. Everyone has their own opinion of of who they like or don't like, and um, but uh, so I said, uh, I, Comcast has the best internet in Chicago. When, when we started uh, FOSIVA, the project. And, um, but Bill taught me uh, about the concerns he was hearing from, uh, from the residents in, in Gilberts. And we actually, uh, the village board of Gilberts took an initiative to take a vote on uh, a referendum to pass uh, for us to build a network in Gilberts, a fiber optic network that would improve everybody's um, internet service in, in the community. Um, as a lot of people in this room would know, the Kane County Board has frozen taxes for a reason. Illinois residents are tired of raising taxes, and the referendum failed, and that failed probably 80% to 20%. But it didn't stop me, the developer. Uh, um, Bill called me one day and said, hey, you know, um, Verizon's out here. They're expanding their network capacity. The guys that are constructing it said uh, you might want to, you know, if, you're, if they're building a trench, if the, now's the time to do it. And I said, you know what, let's, let's do it. And, we, you know, it, again, we talk about, and I'm not going to claim to be the very smart guy who doesn't necessarily know where he's going, but I, I'm a risk taker, and I'm a developer, and it's important for a risk taker to understand the risks involved in, in what you're going to do. So I, I took the time uh, to, to talk to the uh, installers uh, that were working on the, the Verizon project, and, um, and that team is uh, Pertano Construction, uh, and... Uh, we have today, Don White. I, I just want to acknowledge my team because I, this is something that I undertook not as an understanding of, uh, I'm not the uh, Steve Forbes in the dark shirt, or Steve Jobs, yeah, uh, maybe more of a Steve Forbes, but um, Steve Jobs with the dark shirt. I'm not the internet service provider. I'm, I'm just a, a risk financier, and, um, and I understand risk management. And so I put together a great team. And so uh, Pertano Construction, Mike Perino and Don White are here from Pertano. And Don is the, um, the, the guy who uh, has been pr the project coordinator for us there at Pertano. And we worked with um, Northern Illinois University and Roger Swenson, who has designed the network that we put together. And then uh, I went to a, a friend, uh, Cesar Brada, who has a company called uh, Cyber Services. And Cesar... Um, it kind of is my network administrator. So we, we just assembled a team, and, and, and starting an Internet service provider is not as hard as you might think, and I, I, I'm really proud of what we were able to accomplish, but it certainly takes a team effort, and it started with the municipal reach outreach, right? It, it was an engaging process where they educated me on the, the pitfalls, but... Um, so I, I'm not going to get long-winded, but I am proud of my team, and I wanted to say uh, the story of how it impacts a home. I, I can do now, or should I save it? You can save it for I'll the next section. I'll save that. Section. Okay, so I'm going to pass We've got a on. couple other questions we're going to get through, but yeah. Actually, so Matthew. I'll just say more broadly, if I can, just for a Go second. Ahead, um, the benefit of this network, I think, uh, is, you know, first off, it's a high-speed fiber optic network, but it, it allows for an ecosystem where local providers that are in Kane County or close to Kane County, adjacent to the county, can connect in and serve um, the, the, the county more effectively, grow their businesses, grow the reach of their businesses uh, within the territory. Um, it also allows for the interconnectivity with adjacent networks. And Kane County by itself is a good network. Uh, how many miles was that, Roger? 47. 47. 
There are a lot of other networks. If you kind of zoom out from Kane County, look west, look east, look to the north, and so <coughs> forth. There's a lot of, you mentioned the Illinois Century Network. They've got an expansive network across the state of Illinois. So Kane County by itself is a good network. Connect that together with the other networks that are adjacent, and you've got much, much more uh, accessibility in the northern Illinois region and across the state than it on its own. Uh, John, would you like to? Yeah, I'll add a couple quick points. Um, from a data center perspective, <coughs> you know, the, the access to new networks, higher speed networks, into maybe formerly underserved markets now creates an opportunity for commercial businesses or federal government services to get into a, a hardened facility like a bike grid or the other two that are uh, uh, attached to the, uh, the core network here and allows you more resiliency, redundancy, data, data backup services, disaster recovery, allows you to get out of the data center business and focus on your core responsibilities and let someone like us manage your day-to-day -day operations of the facility. And so I think, I think that's probably the strongest benefit from my side of it, what the network brings. And then once you're in a facility like the three that we've talked about today, including BikeGrid, you now have connectivity from each of those facilities to thousands of other places around the world, core connectivity right to downtown Chicago, all the other networks and connectivities between some of the other data centers. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to do things locally and then do backups across the country if you have uh, strong disaster recovery requirements. Okay. Can you get Mark or uh, Dave, would you like yeah, to? I'll just echo a couple of things that uh, Troy and Matt uh, said. I think one of the big benefits of what Kane County has done in, in developing and establishing this network is now, it now gets into the people and actually connecting those people together um, and sharing that information and kind of providing windows that people can look through that they haven't been able to look through before in terms of how they set them or their infrastructure up, um, internet connectivity uh, to data center services to cloud services, all critical to running a business these days, how they can set those up in a, in a different way than before. So a lot of what we do actually is provide dark fiber to customers. We'll turn the glass over to the customer and let them light it themselves. Uh, and one of the, the value propositions for us is really bringing that element of ownership of the network to that end user to where now they're not beholden to us or anybody else about how much bandwidth they want to run on that network. It's a capital purchase to upgrade from 10 gig to 100 gig. And we can, we can manage that for you as well. We, we can uh, light the network ourselves. And it brings me to the second part of what's important. In order to light 100 gig, uh, if that's what the customer is looking for, you need fiber. And we have to be able to interconnect our network to other networks to get to the point where that user wants to take delivery of that service. I would add uh, one big word, collaboration. We're a customer to Kane County. On Light Aurora is a customer to Kane County Fiber. We're also a vendor to Kane County. Whether it's getting Kane into their um, courts in the Aurora area for bond call, or it's providing access into the data centers, or Kane providing us access to one of our customers. Um, the city of Aurora cross-connecting to the city of Naperville to, so that we can be each other's backup on 911. Having our fire stations, we've got 10 fire stations in both cities. They're all connected via that fiber and they share that for high definition telepresence uh, capability so the firefighters don't have to leave the firehouse to do their training. So we look at, we look at collaboration our opportunities. When we first formed, uh, Mayor Tom Weisner and Ted Beck, that was the encouragement. Let's figure out ways to make collaboration occur both within the city and outside the border so that we can make good things happen for everybody. Okay. We're going to try and get on to uh, the next question. And I'm going to combine this with one of the other questions. One of the questions that we constantly get from uh, people, and in, in this comes from both the residential, commercial, education, is you know how much bandwidth is enough and how far do we have to go to meet the demand so one question is how how much bandwidth is is needed or necessary and then the second part is how do we meet this demand and what are our options out there um, I think that's an important question for everyone to understand what the need is and then how how do you supply that need so the first part of this is how much bandwidth do you need my personal preference is you know the county is, is over a gigabit. We're, we're in the point where we're looking at uh, a gigabit plus type of connectivity for the county. Many of the folks up here would say, I need a gigabit to my house. Uh, some of the, you know, I'd love to have that in my house. It's not gonna happen right now, I don't think. But 
Um, so how much uh, do we need? What's the demand? And then, you know, what are our options for that? A uh, lot of options. Uh, one way that we, you know, from a, from a size standpoint, uh, we look to our customers to kind of pr work with them to predict. One of our early indicators is the school districts. The school districts, in collaboration with the state and the federal government, are looking to what needs they think they're going to need per student. So we've got one school district by the end of the summer that we connect at 10 gig. They've got 12,000 students and at least, you know, and, and, and the, all their educators that need to be connected. We've got another school district that's got 30,000 students. They're talking about multiple gigs where the connectivity and the businesses then are going to follow that because they're doing, you know, they've got those kids are going to get educated. They're going to be out into those businesses. We've got a 150 seat call center that's moved into downtown Aurora. They immediately said, we know we're going to need a gig where the bandwidth and we need it to be on all the time and resilient. They parked into the downtown. They've already asked for the gig and they're going to ask for more. And in terms of providing it, we, we look to partner with multiple um, service providers to bring that bandwidth in so that we've got, we can always get more from any one of those providers. And if any of them have trouble, we can flip to one of the other ones automatically and continue to serve our customers. So again, look to our customers to decide, you know, predict how much and look to our vendors to kind of provide that to us and, and give us the ability to upscale at will. The, uh, the first part of the question, how much bandwidth is required do we need? I really don't know the answer to that. Um, we are increasingly in, in a wireless world, um, as we like to say. And I was uh, downtown yesterday at a, a real estate development uh, event. Uh, Google Fiber was there. They've announced that, that they're coming to Chicago. They're looking at it. Um, and talking to the Google Fiber folks, they're in the exploratory phase. So to your point about being relatively tight-lipped, they are. Um, but they gave a short presentation, and, and one of the, the statistics uh, studies that was presented was that in four years, uh, it's estimated that most homes will have 50 connected devices in the home. Um, and you know, I know from troubleshooting a bandwidth problem at my home recently, I was surprised to find that I had 15 or so, and I couldn't count the 15. But there were a couple things that are always on that you just don't think are on, and then I shut a couple things off. And then I've got two daughters at home, and they represent, I think, the top 2% of wireless users that drive 50% of internet traffic that comes from two websites, those being uh, Netflix and YouTube. So you have that going on, not just when you're on the go, but when you're at home and when you're at the office and when you're standing outside the office on break. And it's just driving a need for some creative solutions. And so, you know, at, at Crown and at Sinesis, uh, it's, it's going to be a wireless infrastructure, and that's going to be founded on fiber. There's no, there's no way t that I can think of foundationally that you, you can avoid aggregating traffic back onto the big pipes and the stability that fiber optics provide. So the foundation that's been laid in Kane County is really, really critical from that perspective. And then the people in this room and, and the creative ideas that come over time to figure out how to push that bandwidth delivery system out to where it's demanded by the users. And I think that's something that, that happens over time and, um, you know, it's started to happen here. Thank you. John? You know, from the data center side of it, um, there's, there's two stories we have. We either have a customer who's moving out of their current data center environment, their own homegrown solution at their corporate location. So they already have an idea of the traffic patterns that they have. So our consultants or your VAR or your networking partner will help you figure out that traffic study and design it properly coming into our facility. But then we start to think about, did you design it for growth so that you go from some starting point and you have the ability to burst up to something else or do you have dedicated lines and you have to have f full time commitment. So we have to look at that. And then some of the things that I wanted to highlight that drive the demand inside, you know, the user population of our, our client base. Um, regulatory compliance. You have more things stored for a longer period of time. You're doing nightly disaster recovery backups or you're doing real time backups. Maybe you have to leverage um, a production facility here in Aurora and then you're backing up to our Annapolis facility in the DC market. So we have to leverage the network capacity to support your traffic, not only for your inbound, outbound, normal daily business, but what you're doing after hours to keep the lights on in case there's a challenge in your current facilities. Um, second thing I would add in, in the shift is, is really um, 
com compliance has an incredible impact on customers who have to be audited and regulated. And I can tell you that they don't plan ahead for the redundancy. And that's one of the things we always end up helping customers with afterwards. So the more you think about that up front, the better off you are. Disaster recovery is key, right? You might only need one gig for your solution, but what if that network is down? You need an alternative. So we're designing everything in at least minimum you know, pairs. Okay. okay. So in terms of how much, obviously the answer is lots, and it's more than a megabit, right? Yeah. So um, two, di two data points. <clears throat> in uh, just last year, the FCC uh, upgraded the definition of broadband across the country from one meg up, four meg down, to five meg up and 25 meg down, right? So across the country, that's their definition now of broadband. So we know where the trends are going. While I have no idea, I wouldn't be surprised if three, four, five years from now, that gets reset again and it's gonna go further north. Secondly, with regards to education, an organization called the State Educational Technology Directors Association, so again, focused on K through 12 education, has given guidance that by next year, they want to see uh, a gigabit of capacity for every 1,000 students and faculty in a school or school district, right? So they're pushing the envelope already in terms of what's needed to support uh, the schools and school districts out there. And I'll just talk just briefly about municipalities in terms of what the driver of, of traffic is. Um, I work at NIU, we do lots of research about lots of things, and one, one thing in particular in, in municipal government is uh, the provision of e-government services, information, and so forth, the presence online, right? So we've seen with more uh, capacity, internet capacity, uh, um, that budgets, uh, consolidated annual financial reports, meetings, agendas, the overall web content, the web presence up online is much broader. It allows your citizens much better, more access into the municipal operation. That's one, right? So if you've got a slow connection, your ability to upload and download budgets and, and uh, the CAFRs, which are quite large arguments, is difficult to do. So that, that's an enabling type of thing there. And then secondly, on the two-way communication side, so social media, online requests and complaints, bill pay functionalities, um, and then the sort of the embracement of mobile technology across uh, across you know, the Internet of Things. Everybody's carrying a mobile device. That's where things are going. So those are kind of the, the drivers in one particular segment um, of society that will just continue to prol proliferate, I think, in years ahead. Troy, do you want to answer that? Uh, uh, from, a, from a residential standpoint, um, uh, uh, just the, the, the quick gist of how much is enough and, and what is the right amount. Um, when we opened the model in March of uh, last year, AT&T was the only utility uh, provider that would have any internet service available other than like s satellite broadcast. And satellite broadcast is, is probably good enough to get your emails, but it's certainly not good enough to stream video or anything like that if you've ever used a YouTube or um, Netflix or anything like that. Um, when the model doors opened, AT&T installed a 16 megabits per second system in the Conservancy. Uh, Mike's trucks at Pertano uh, got into the trench. What the, when you do a trench, you call ComEd, and they put the trench in the backyard, and it's called it like a tri-party trench agreement. ComEd, AT&T, and your usual cable provider. But we didn't have a cable provider. We were not able to get a will-serve letter from any cable provider in the village of Gilbert. And so, uh, so we, we started laying our fiber optic. And I think someone at AT&T must have taken notice because the guy came out, um, I was in the uh, model home, and within a week after the doors opened, they were scratching their heads. The guy said, I was just out here. We put in a 16 megabit per system. We're, we've upgraded you to the 24 megabit quad system. And, and so they changed all of the technology they just installed when they, I believe they saw what we were doing out there. Um, and, and, and then uh, January of this year, we debuted Foceva in the community with one gigabit service to the home as shared broadband. And, uh, and th this spring, AT&T is now selling to customers in the Conservancy 350 megabits per second service with a television package for $130 a month. Now, if you look, when you go home and enter your address on AT&T's website, I'm pretty sure that nobody in this room can get that service 
anywhere in Chicago, but the conservancy homes are getting that service. And so they're competing with me because um, I'm Fosiva and, um, and, and my internet is, uh, has five customers. So uh, <laughs> I don't know how it's going to go, um, but when we look at how we use it, uh, the you know streaming 4K televisions where you go into Best Buy and say the new 4K TV, even the cable providers are not broadcasting in 4K yet. But if you go in our home, you are streaming without buffer 4K television from YouTube and Netflix that, and Amazon. That you just you, it's just amazing, beautiful color, everything else. So, okay, Roger, just say yes, one John. word. Out to a couple of comments here. First of all, thanks, Matt, for pointing out that my broadband connection, quote unquote, is doesn't qualify for the FCC stats anymore. So, my <laughs> troubleshooting efforts didn't work apparently with uh, with my provider. Uh, but I think uh, another part of this is the type of connectivity that's that's being demanded. So it's not just the amount of bandwidth potentially to drive that you know window uh, or access into government for payment systems for accessing information or with a private enterprise for the same types of things. Um, securing that data um, and making sure that you have control and possession of it um, is, is more and more important too. And so John talked about it from a standards perspective. You know, opening up all these apps to allow you convenience is great, but you know, having the data leak on the other end is not such a great thing for that organization. And so that fiber infrastructure provides um, the option for an enterprise uh, to take a private connection and not share that bandwidth with anybody else, and that's a lot of what we do as well. For the sake of uh, trying to keep on schedule, we're going to skip to a question near the end, which is really uh, near and dear to my uh, interest in this, and that is really how do you get connected with some of these folks? And you know, we go through a, a kind of a learning process, all of us do, with this technology. Uh, some of it may be familiar, but for a lot of us, it's where do I start? Where do I begin the conversation? So one of the things I wanted to do was give these folks uh, a way to express how, where do we begin? Where do you begin with them? And what types of uh, interest is there out there? So if they have uh, some information or something they'd like to share about, you know, where they think you should get started, I think that would be important from their perspective. So we'll start uh, here with Troy. And how do you get started with these folks? And where do you go? I, I think the single most important uh, lesson to be learned for Kane County today was something that, that Michael brought up, which is internet inclusion. Because as a businessman, I would go to the most dense populated uh, apartment building and offer internet service to those people because the bill that you get from the construction folks would be the, the smallest bill with the most potential customers. Um, but is that uh, an equitable solution for Kane County government as you look at how to address the needs of the entire community? And Kane County is much different than Cook County. And so working with the municipal levels of government and trying to understand how to put private dollars to work on a balanced approach within the community is, is, the, is the best challenge. And I'm certainly... Uh, my company, Fosiva, uh, is ready to offer services throughout Kane County, and uh, and that's kind of what our website has debuted here. Uh, we we uh, my website developer at Ellington is here uh, today, and he was the designer of the website, and his company, Cloud9, is a great start for anybody looking to start their internet uh, web page presence. And he certainly makes us look like a real company. So I was very thankful and appreciative of that. And so uh, I would be happy to talk to any, uh, any governmental uh, authority here in Kane County about how to bring resources. And I'm a risk financier, and I, I do put money to work um, on a, uh, when it makes sense. So, Thank you. So I think if you want to connect in Kane County, first and foremost, do we just call Roger? We, we do have some information on our fiber.countyofkane.org uh, website, and we would be happy to try and connect people back to resources. So, so that's yes. number one. So, uh, and uh, Troy alluded to it as well. You have to have, if you want, if you're um, somebody who provides network services, like in Kane County and so on, you have to have an online presence. That online presence has to do many things well, but a couple things is, one, to articulate what the network even is, what the footprint looks like, who it connects to, the services that are on it, uh, the data centers they may connect to, et cetera. And then, uh, and then simply how, how one might connect to it if you're a residential 
a homeowner, if you're a business, what you need, what steps you need to take to connect into that network. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'll just reinforce the point. These networks are fantastic on their own. Uh, uh, we, it was alluded to earlier, the, the real promise of success is collaboration within the county, uh, within the partners that are in this room, but also outside of this county, between Kane and DeKalb County, between Kane and Cook and so forth. And that's where the real success is. And just a shameless plug for NIU, since I worked there and I mentioned that we've got this broadband development consulting group, uh, we can assist public sector entities with thinking through technology challenges, thinking through how broadband can can um, alter or enhance uh, their operations. So uh, by all means, just Google NIU Broadband Development Group, you'll find us easily. We've got a uh, easy contact and we'll be in touch uh, uh, very shortly afterwards. And we do have a booth outside, so feel free to stop by um, and introduce yourself. Thank you. So playing off a similar theme, if you're going to try and get in touch with Roger, you're actually going to do that over on Lights Fiber into the bike grid network to get to his computer. So, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, for those of you looking at the rest of the world, you know, I view your network connectivity as something that's going to come through some of the other providers that are here, and it's your on-ramp to the rest of the world, right? You get into a data center infrastructure like us or some of the other players in the space, and now we have access to 10 or 15 other carriers that are in our own buildings so we can cross-connect to all these other networks, help you reach out to the rest of the world and your other business partners, and even connect, you know, to CIRMAC and, and reach internationally from there. So lots of great opportunity. If you want to learn more about Bike Grid, obviously off the website, um, you know, we're here in the outside break room area. Happy to talk to you uh, afterwards. So thanks for the time. Thank you. Yeah, and I think there's, you know, this is great. There's multiple opportunities. Um, I, we work with the NIUNet folks, um, and so they know us, we know them. Um, Chairman Lausen and Roger are more recent connections. I have no doubt we'll find more opportunities to work together as we go forward as well. Um, but you've got a resource here in Kane County to connect to, to connect you with other folks that can do things for you. Um, and the data center operators themselves are, are great resources, like John just said. Um, they are you know, access points to lots of different networks. Um, and, you know, what pops to my mind is a connection we're doing for a company right now who wants to be in a data center here that's located in Wisconsin. And that data center provider connected that user with us. So, you know, we're all trying to be as transparent as possible about what the capabilities are and where they exist. And I think you've got multiple touch points. But you know, I'll also add that um, you've got to figure out what you're trying to accomplish uh, as well. You know, you may not all know what the possibilities are from an infrastructure perspective, but there's got to be good business drivers behind it, and some of us or all of us can help you flesh that out as well uh, when you give us a call. Come to onlightaurora.com. That's our website. You, know, you can see me afterwards. Um, if you're looking to get connected to uh, the Internet, get high-speed internet bandwidth, um, get connected to one of the data centers that are on the network. Um, we've worked with other people getting connected back up into Kane County because we can work together with the folks at Kane County. Um, give us a call and we'll work with you to engineer a solution. I'd like to give uh, uh, Mr. Michael Burke a chance to make any final comments about uh, the fiber network and the, the initiatives that we have going on in Kane County. but. Uh, Michael, if you, if you well, would well, indulge great. us. Uh, let me just comment on a couple of things that have been said about how much bandwidth and, and, and why it's important. And I, I do relate to real estate developers. I've, I have been one and am one um, and the risk that's involved. Um, if you can imagine having a beautiful home, a subdivision, and you're trying to sell it, and you say, oh, by the way, we, we have everything but electricity. And I, I think the future is and is whether it's business, whether it's schools, whether it's government, um, or certainly fiber to the home. If, if you, you know, it's going to be an amenity that you're going to list on your listing statement as to what you have access to. And that, that continues to change. It continues to go up. The, the demand um, is, is tremendous. And um, I, I know there are a lot of elected officials here. Um, you know, we've had to tackle in our... Uh, government, uh, a lot of issues, um, e everything from from what data do we release to the public, and, and we've opted more more data to the public. They can access more information about water and sewer and electrical lines and maps and mapping, um, because that that type of data can be very uh, 
powerful uh, uh, service that the community can provide. But also, um, you know, what kind of public spaces do you have that you need bandwidth for, not just to communicate with police and fire, but um, I know in our convention center, you know, we, we have Wi-Fi, but the convention center people consider it a, a, a profit center. And I keep arguing, and I think I'm winning the argument. It's not a profit center, it's an amenity. It's an amenity you need to provide or your meeting managers that come in and can't get good bandwidth, um, they're not going to blame the meeting manager. They're going to blame the, the convention center. So there are a lot, of, a lot of areas in your community that you might not think need the bandwidth, but they do. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank all the panelists for participating in today's discussions. I hope that you found some of their comments helpful. We wanted to present some of the faces and people that are doing some of these things behind the scenes. And they are, they're a part of our community. They're available to us as resources. They make their living and their business doing these types of services. They're very good at it. And I would encourage you to visit the booth, talk with some of them after we're done uh, with this meeting. But once again, I'd just like to thank them for coming up and taking the time to just share some of their insight with us. So if you wouldn't mind indulging, give them a round of applause.